Hello, everyone. This is Christine from Green Book. Welcome, and thank you for attending today's webinar brought to us by Distillery. Our speakers today are Gilad Barash and Rick Kelly, and they will be talking about market research is ready for AI, are you? A few housekeeping items. Uh, we are scheduled for one hour. Your lines are muted, so please, if you would, enter your questions in the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. And we are recording today, and we will send you a link to the recording via email. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Gilad and Rick. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for listening in. This is Gilad and Rick here. And I wanted to start by saying, first of all, that if any of you um, were at uh, IIEX a couple of weeks ago in Austin and attended any of the talks, hopefully, aside from the barbecue and those electric scooters that were all over town, you may remember Distillery's talk um, where we mentioned that AI for marketing is here, but how can you really cut through the buzzwords around AI and understand what AI means in general, as well as for marketing in particular and how to evaluate whether a potential AI partner is a good fit for you. So these are some of the things that we're going to discuss today. We're going to start by demystifying AI a little bit and talk about how big data is really the fuel for, for marketing AI. We'll show a few custom AI analyses and insights for marketing. Um, and then we'll talk about combining different types of data. In this case, we'll talk specifically about behavioral and traditional research or survey data, how those can be combined to give you even more marketing power. Um, we'll, we'll dig deeper into that with a case study from Fuel Cycle about how that was done. And finally, we will wrap it up with asking a few questions that we believe are important to ask any potential AI partner that you might be considering pairing with to really evaluate and understand um, if they're a good fit for you. And then at the end, we'll take uh, some questions. So let's get started by talking about um, demystifying AI a little bit. So when Distillery's chief uh, data scientist, Melinda Hahn Williams, wrote about AI in a Green Book blog post a couple of years ago, she claimed that AI is not magic. But one of Distillery's advisors from NYU redacted that claim and claimed that, you know what, there is, it is kind of magic. But it's not this kind of magic. It's not spells and potions and muggles and Hogwarts, but rather it's this kind of magic. It's about being precise and intuitive, using good technique to create results that while they may seem unexpected, there's a logical explanation to them and how you arrived at them. Being a good AI practitioner is akin to being a good magician. It takes skill, it takes seasoning, and an understanding of how to relate to your target audience, whether to their need to be entertained or their need to be informed. So AI is everywhere in our lives. How, how does this magic work? And what, where does AI touch our lives? So a couple of examples. First of all, it's very prevalent in games. AI ultimately simulates human behavior. And you can think in games, for example, like uh, IBM's Deep Blue computer beating Garry Kasparov in chess in the late 90s. That was one of the big breakthroughs where AI can simulate human behavior playing games. Another area that's very prevalent in our lives is in image recognition. These are screenshots from my phone. My brother Guy is recognized on the left as a person and is recognized in other pics even though he's wearing sunglasses or he's around my other brothers, which we all look very much alike, and yet the computer is able to recognize his face based on patterns in, the, in his face that suggest that he's the same person. And lastly, we talk about market research. Analyzing data about humans and finding patterns in that data can lead to finding segments or clusters of people who have similar patterns. And understanding the differences between these segments can help us understand more about our customers, who they are, what drives them, and how to connect with them in order to increase engagement. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So before we tackle what AI really is, let's take a moment to discuss what it isn't. AI doesn't mean automation. 
if you have automated processes going on at, at, in your organization, things are happening quickly and automatically and over and over and are repeated, that does not necessarily mean it's AI. AI takes advantage of, of automation, but automation in itself does not mean AI. Also, if a regression model was run once or twice in the past to arrive at some kind of conclusion, that again does not necessarily mean that you have AI in the organization or that you use it as a tool in order to make decisions. And lastly, business intelligence, or BI, does not mean that you have AI. Um, BI is a collection and analysis of business data, and it's more about collating data and reporting it rather than organically utilizing it, processing it, and finding the, the patterns in it in order to inform decisions that are being made. So AI, or artificial intelligence, in our uh, domain um, and in our focus are machines that make informed decisions autonomously. Given some data, they're able to analyze it and to make decisions. They focus on a single task, and when focusing on a single task, a machine gets very good at performing that task, even better at, than humans. And you can think back to that example of the chess player. Any single task, when we give a computer a defined task to, to uh, do, it can do it, it can ultimately learn and be more efficient and do less uh, errors than humans. And so, lastly, we say that AI is ready for market research for a few different reasons. First of all, the algorithms are mature. The AI algorithms have been around for a long time. AI practitioners understand how they work and which algorithms would be best suited to what kind of market research problems we're trying to solve. The second big thing is data. There is so much data today. There's data, data, and data. There's internet, social, mobile, behavioral, uh, uh, survey data. The, the list goes on and on. All of this data, the more data that we have, the more we can inform the machine in the uh, decisions that it's making. And lastly, none of this would be possible, even if we have algorithms, and even if we have a lot of data, we would not be able to process all of that data if we didn't have cheaper and more powerful hardware than ever before. That allows for large-scale and complex analysis of the data by those algorithms. So now we finally have, we have the mature algorithms, we've got all the data, and we also now have the infrastructure to be able to analyze it. That's why we say that market research is ready for AI. Another term you may hear floating around here and there is machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of AI, and it's a tool in the toolbox of AI in order to help it do its job. Machine learning is machines that learn behavior by finding patterns in data. And analyzing those patterns in the data can help us in a couple of different ways. First of all, it can be descriptive. By that I mean that it describes the current situation, for example, segment analysis, looking at a bunch of people and understanding where they're similar and where they're different and what those differences are. But it can also be prescriptive, i.e. it's able to predict possible future actions. For example, the likelihood of being interested in buying a product or going to a car dealership or doing some kind of outcome that we're interested by analyzing past behaviors of people, we're also able to predict their future behaviors based on that. So we talked a little bit about what AI is and how it's an engine for market research. And if AI is the engine that drives market research innovation, then big data is the fuel that feeds that engine. And we're going to talk a little bit about the type of data that distillery uses in its AI engine. Our predictive models are based on passive signals. This is data that we collect from a bunch of different signals, passive signals that exist. These things include mobile app usage, websites that people browse at, search terms that are being searched, different content interests that people are looking at, geolocation data that comes from mobile devices, as well as first-party data such as 
CRM data that we, that we can ingest if it's, let's say, loyalty card programs or people that have visited certain store locations, maybe people that have bought certain types of products or a certain value. All of, these, all of this data that we listen to that, is, uh, that exists around us, we are exposed to and we collect and we synthesize together. So every day across the U.S. we see over 160 billion data points for over 450 million devices which translate into 250 million individuals on a daily basis. And using that data we create over 10,000 predictive models that are refreshed daily. These different models represent different behaviors that we are looking for in the data. So historically, we have these time-stamped activities of where people visited on the web, where they visited physically, locations, and we synthesize all of that data in order to create these predictive models that model behavior. And we'll see how we use those models in a second. What is it that we can, that we can uh, uh, create using those models? The information that we, that, we can, that we can pull based on these predictive models are things like audience discovery, understanding the differences between different groups of people, subpopulation within a given audience, whether it's people who are interested in a product, whether it's people who are uh, uh, you know, at a certain life stage, etc. We can do journey mapping to understand the journey, the consumer journey that led them up to the point where they were doing something of interest, whatever outcome it is that we're interested in, and we'll see an example of that in a minute. We can do geolocation insights and understand for people who visit a certain place, a certain, whether it be a car dealership, whether it be a college, whether it be certain type of restaurant, we can understand what their behaviors are. It can help for sales planning insights, content and creative direction for targeting, as well as targeting itself uh, to different types of groups. So that's all the things that, can act, that our AI engine can do given the big data that we collect. So to summarize, we say that data is the fuel and AI is the engine. This data that we're talking about is first of all observed. This is data that not, it isn't self-reported by people, but rather we see their actual observed behaviors online and offline. It's behavioral. We see what they're actually doing. It's a huge sample. Like we said, it's 250 million people across the United States daily. And we aggregate all of this data into hundreds of millions of quality filtered, continually updated journey profiles for each and every one of those 250 million people. So we see what they're doing throughout the day and throughout the life time of their uh, data. And then AI takes all of that data and finds the behaviors that you're looking for by learning patterns within those historical journey profiles. So now that we've talked a little bit about the engine and the fuel that feeds that engine, let's, let's dive in a little deeper and look at a couple of custom AI analytics for marketing insights and innovation. <clears throat> so we're going to start with a case study that we had about a marketer who wanted to understand more about people who were interested in natural products in order to help strategize around new products and messaging. So using AI for audience discovery, we clustered and segmented people who were researching and engaging with natural products online into these segments to understand what are the different behaviors that identify different groups who are interested in natural uh, products. What we found is a total of five main segments of these people. Three of them were big main segments. The preventative health advocates were roughly about 25% of the people that we saw. These are people who are engaging with their doctors, who are uh, uh, researching certain conditions, diseases, illnesses, and preventative medicine. Another big uh, segment that we saw was the wellness devotees. These are people 
who are looking at healthy lifestyles, at yoga, at organics, at probiotics, at different healthy and natural alternatives to promote their lifestyles in general. They were also about roughly 25% of the population. And another big one that we saw were the prenatal planners. These were people who were researching about pregnancy. They were researching about baby products and names, etc. But we also saw two smaller segments that we call emerging segments that the signal was a little more mixed but was also very interesting. These were the family providers and protectors. While they were interested in natural products, they were also engaging in family-oriented content, looking at things to do with their families, looking at uh, home improvement and protection, as well as the fitness-focused stress relievers. This was predominantly male people who were looking at men's health as well as uh, mental health. And so that was another sub-segment uh, that was very interesting. These were roughly about 10% each of the population that we saw. So as you can see, this gives us information about who the people are that are um, interested in natural products. But we can also dive deeper into these segments and, and ask and answer more fine-grained questions about them. What are they interested in? What did they look for? What products are they engaged with? So let's focus on the wellness devotees, on the second segment, and let's see what else we can learn about them. We noticed in the data that people in this segment were interested in probiotics. They were looking up and researching probiotics um, on the web. And so we, we, we could dive deeper into this vertical and into this product and understand early signs of entering the market for probiotic products. In a sense, we're seeing a marketing funnel of behavior that leads to interest in probiotics for these people. So in this case, what we're looking at here is sort of this funnel that goes from left to right as the colors get darker. So in early stages of the funnel, where we call it sort of the discovery phase, we see that they're doing things like reading about kitchen blogs and recipe and ingredients and healthy eating. And as they progress in that funnel and they start researching health benefits, they're doing things like diet and weight loss and holistic medicine and medical journals. As they continue deeper into the funnel, they look at, um, they start consulting trusted voices and researching different lifestyles, content readers, mommy bloggers, etc., until they are officially in the market for probiotics and they're looking and shopping around, maybe doing comparison shopping, maybe trying to figure out where to buy these probiotics. And so once they're in that group, we see that they're also looking for vitamin shop, vitamins and natural diet supplements. So as you can see here, we, sh we see that probiotic shoppers display early predictive signals prior to being considered in market for probiotics. And understanding these behaviors, the reason it's important is because it enables early engagement. And as we see, there's no one path to becoming an in-market probiotic shopper, especially as consumers have different reasons for reconsidering their health and wellness choices. But these are the stages that we found best define that process of becoming an in-market probiotic shopper um, that we described below. Another product that we saw that the wellness segment was interested in was organic beauty and skincare supplies. And because we score people's interest every day and we analyze them every day, we can look back historically at seasonal trends of certain behavioral audiences and see how they relate to those products. So in this case, what we're looking at is people who are interested in beauty and skincare buyers, in organic beauty and skincare buyers, and how, they, how the, their, their seasonal fluctuation change over the course of almost about three quarters of a year. And we specifically looked at two different audiences or two different interests. One of them was Hanukkah celebration planners, and one of them was bride and wedding planners. And interestingly enough, we see that Hanukkah celebration planners become increasingly more characteristic of 
beauty and skincare buyers as the holiday season approaches and we get closer and closer to Hanukkah. And brides and wedding planners appears, the one on top appears to fluctuate according to popular times of years for weddings. So we see that we can uh, um, overlay different types of interests and behaviors and see how they relate to each other even on a temporal basis to see seasonal trends and fluctuations. In this case, the two different audiences that we looked at, and there are many more, I thought these were an interesting anecdote, we see how they, they differ in their engagement with organic beauty and skincare buyers over time. So the examples that we talked about up until now were based on the behavioral data that distillery collects. But even more marketing power can be obtained by combining data sources such as primary research data or surveys. If we go back to talking about the wellness uh, segment, based on our geolocation data that we collect, we notice that this segment also visits the gym, which is no big surprise. But if we wanted to understand more about their gym going habits, right, our behavioral digital data shows that they visited the gym, but our blind spot is that we may know what they're doing, but we don't know why they're doing it. So our observed data on the right here shows us gym visitors, but we don't know why they're going to that gym. But we know that people who take surveys about gyms can give us attitudinal information about why they're doing it. And so this is a great opportunity to combine these two types of data in order to get a much more holistic view of both the best of both worlds, both what and why. We can combine these two and see how they complement and enrich each other. So in that overlap area, in this Venn diagram, we see these are people who respond to the surveys and also go to the gym. They might be a prime target for expanding the surveys and engaging with because they're more likely to answer surveys than your average gym goer. And so we could see an increase in precision when choosing the survey takers. Now, by statistical modeling that we discussed earlier, we can also scale these different audiences up for different reasons. One big reason that we can scale this, this audience up is for targeting. We could find people who are similar in their behavior to people who go to the gym and answer surveys. So we can target them, but we can also find more of these survey takers or these potential survey takers to help and that will be more amenable to answering the surveys of the people that go to the gym. So scaling these audiences is a really great way to utilize the combination of these data sources. Another use case is data enrichment where by merging the behavioral and the attitudinal data, we get a more holistic view of the people who are in this segment. We understand, like we mentioned, the what and the why for these people. So we can decide how to better engage with them, maybe what their other needs are that are not being met, and how we can uh, message them in a more efficient manner. So this was a, uh, uh, an example, a theoretical example of what we could do with this. But to delve deeper into this powerful use case, I'm going to turn it over to Rick Kelly from our partner Fuel Cycle to present a, an actual case study. Hey, thanks a lot, Gilad. It's uh, you know it's great to talk through all the applications of AI and research. I, I especially love like the title of this presentation, uh, really around demystifying AI and how it becomes practical to to market researchers. I think it's one of those things we hear about all the time um, that we hear about but that we don't necessarily know how we can apply to research in general. And so I'm very happy to talk through uh, some of the things that, uh, that we we're doing over here at Fuel Cycle. As, uh, as Gilan mentioned, uh, we recently partnered with Distillery, announced that a, a few weeks ago at IIEX, uh, to incorporate Distillery's behavioral data into our research community platform. And uh, to give you some context as we walk through a couple examples here, 
and how uh, this applies to, to research and, and kind of uh, make this a little more actionable for you. Um, I'll give you some examples of how we're using this behavioral data in research communities. So first of all, uh, field cycle customers can generally enrich the, their profiles of, with community-based research with distilleries observed behavioral insights. And so what this does is we're able to go beyond kind of just traditional demographic uh, information that we collect on community members and their stated preference data, you know, what, what they describe their affinity categories as, and we can actually pull in real behavioral data. Uh, and how this helps is in conjunction with our progressive profiling functionality, we're able to ensure that information around consumers is always up to date. Uh, for instance, uh, say somebody moves into a car buying funnel. Uh, so they may be interested in, in purchasing a car. And so we can actually append that information to their uh, profile and use that when we're creating groups or running analysis on fuel cycle, whether that's a, a large-scale quantitative activity or we're doing something like a focus group or a discussion board on our platform. We always have the up-to-date data around their car buying interest. And then say in a few months when they've actually made a car acquisition, uh, we can move that, we can update their profiling information, and that way you always have accurate, up-to-date, fresh data. And that, you know, really enables us to do better and more analysis than we were, you know, we have been traditionally. Um, and just as a quick note here, uh, it's important that we also discuss, like, privacy and how this applies to, to research here. Um, so between, like, distillery and fuel cycle, we actually don't exchange any PII uh, and consumers opt in to participating and continue to retain control of the data that they have associated with their profile. Um, and this helps us do this in a very privacy forward, uh, privacy you know, regulation compliant way uh, to ensure that we can make, build a sustainable uh, future for, for insights in general. So as we talk about profile augmentation, uh, which, which Gil had just mentioned, it's uh, really about making more profiling information available and going beyond demographics. So, you know, really if we think back as to uh, why we use demographics as a, a common schema for, for insights, and, you know, in most cases we're trying to uh, group people together in somewhat arbitrary ways to, you know, develop an explanatory model for why they do what they do. And so we split people by male, female, we split people by 18 to 24 versus 25 to 34, and so on. And these are kind of arbitrary cutoffs that we've accepted as a standard. And uh, so, you know, this, uh, these, these segmentation schemes were developed, you know, uh, almost 100 years ago or more. And now we can actually, you know, move well beyond that and uh, focus on what people actually do rather than just uh, the basic demographics, whether it's, you know, age, gender, income, or, and beyond, and actually cut data by things like car buying intent or what, what stage of the car, you know, car purchase and you know, ton of funnel that they are actually in. And so some of the use cases, you know, here that we've kind of, we've, we've said is we actually answer real critical questions with a high degree of confidence. So, you know, what co co content categories do my survey respondents actually go to? You know, which websites should we be advertising on? Uh, which audiences are going to be most valuable for us. And so to kind of think through this and how we've, uh, we've you, know, act, uh, uh, you know, made this a little more actionable, I can talk about a, a early, you know, like an early story from our partnership with one of our CPG clients who wanted to connect uh, their very early stage concept and product development plans and inform more of their go-to-market plans. So this, uh, the CPG company was tasked by their leadership to say, look, we need to connect the dots from these very early stage concepts, uh, doing lots of initial product testing, and actually uh, you know, help the go-to-market team be more successful in the bringing products to mar market. And so what they found is by bringing in behavioral data and combining that with uh, first-party uh, research data, or the stated preference data, is they found very significant differences when using behavioral data versus just demographics. Um, so rather than just looking at uh, age or gender, uh, they're able to look at uh, category affinities, you know, uh, something like a natural uh, wellness affinity versus non, you know, a, a lesser concern for natural wellness. And so they found that products that had gone to market or would have gone to market and been greenlit under their own, you know, original uh, segmentation uh, scheme, maybe no longer would go to market because they didn't. Uh, you know, they meet the standards for moving to the state, you know, stage of the product innovation funnel. And so by being able to slice data by affinity categories, they increase their confidence and ability uh, to predict 
what products will be successful in the market. And in addition to that, they're also better advisors to the marketing and go-to-market teams. So they can highlight audiences that are better for digital activation uh, versus others and actually point their marketing team in the right direction to go out and activate audiences against those. And so uh, although this is all you know, relatively new, I, I think that companies that adopt AI and use and layer on behavioral data uh, in conjunction with their primary research data are really going to gain a competitive edge and uh, be more successful in the near term than uh, otherwise. Ilan, over to you. All right, thank you, Rick. That was really interesting. So <clears throat> let's close the loop on all of this. And now that we understand more about what AI is and how different types of data can fuel it, and what are some of the questions that we can ask a potential AI partner in order to under ascertain whether they're truly doing AI and whether they're a good fit for us. And so we've compiled a list of questions. This is by no means a comprehensive list, and they may not all apply to your specific businesses and needs, but it's rather a primer and a conversation starter uh, to get ideas flowing about how to evaluate potential AI partners. Um, so with that, let's jump into some of these questions. So one question is, what data do you use and what biases exist in this data? If you are using social data, it's obviously going to skew a little younger. If you're using certain loyalty shopping data, it depends on what the products are. So it's important to know what type of data and what the data is and what the skews that you see so that results don't surprise you when you suddenly see that reflected in the analytics and in the decision making that you are going to be making based off of this information. Another question is in regards to these uh, models that you're producing, how do you know that they work? How do you measure their success? How do you evaluate them? These models, once they're created, need to be compared to some sort of ground truth, to some sort of uh, data that we do know in order to see how well they work. What's the process around evaluating these models? What's the confidence that they work? And how do you measure their success? That's an important thing for an AI partner to be able to explain to you when you're asking about their AI capabilities. It would be um, nice if their AI solution was backed up by any kind of demonstrable scientific rigor? Do they produce any white papers around it? Do they present the technologies that they've created and the methodologies at any conferences? Is there any peer-reviewed feedback about their methodologies, if not their product? So what, do they have any patents around the technologies that they've created? Is there any innovation in the technology that they've created? Those would be good ways of identifying the scientific rigor and robustness of the solutions that they are proposing. Another question that I think is important is, can this potential AI provider go beyond buzzwords and explain exactly how the AI solution solves the problem that you have? We've all heard these buzzwords, AI and machine learning, and, and, and predictive analytics and models, et cetera. But can they explain how those me me mechanisms and technologies actually solve the problem that you are presenting to them that you are trying to solve? And more importantly, once they've explained how those methodologies can solve your problem, can you explain it once they're done? Did it make sense? Does it flow correctly? Is it, can you remember what it is that it actually does? That's a very important test to understand if that methodology is clear. You could get a little bit more into the weeds in terms of uh, maybe running a, t a pilot or a test case where you give them a test data set and get some results back to test the scenario to see if the results make sense, if they're actionable, if there's something that you can actually use, and if they can explain the results that they got. 
And another question that can be important is, as we said, AI and machine learning in particular that looks at, his, at data and finds pattern in past behavior, the question is how far back does this data go that is used to, being, to, used to build the models? And how does it change? Does the, does the data get updated when the models get refreshed? How often do they get refreshed? This pertains to how fresh the results and the decision making that goes on through the AI engine is. If it's run once every six months, then you may find yourself using stale models and stale data that don't necessarily reflect the decisions that you have to make today based on changes in the market and changes that your customers undergo. But if the data that is used continually gets updated and is used, the, the look back window continually gets updated, and the models continually get refreshed, then you have more confidence that you are looking at up-to-date data, making up-to-date decisions for current consumers. So these are some of the questions that we feel are important to ask a potential uh, AI provider that you're going to work with. So now that we've talked about all of these different things in terms of what AI is and how to de demystify it, and it being an engine for market research and innovation, and how big data is the fuel for that engine, and how we can combine different types of data to get even more marketing power and more insight into the, our consumers, and we even talked about a case study and showed some examples I hope that this talk was helpful in understanding how AI and market research are tailor-made for each other today. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask and we'll try to answer them. But thank you so much for your uh, attention today. Okay. Anybody, if you have your questions, you can put them in the chat box there in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Okay. There's a question. So one question that, I, uh, that came up is the data that you're looking at is behavioral. What measures or protocols do you use to protect the privacy of the people in your audiences? That's a great question. Privacy is a very big concern when dealing with this type of data. At Distillery, the data that we look at is completely anonymous. We do not store any PII or personal, uh, personally identifiable information. We don't know emails, phone numbers, addresses, names, none of that. The only thing that we see are anonymous cookie IDs and device IDs, and we aggregate the data based off of that. So we are less interested in, in, in personal behavior of one person, but rather to be able to aggregate them and find patterns based on these anonymous user profiles that we get. So we're very careful about keeping that data anonymous and not being able to tie it back into any particular person. Um, there another question is, can you describe a bit more of the underlying data that went into development of the natural segments? Yes. So the models that we've created, our behavioral models, as we saw, are based off of web uh, activity of people. So we identified certain websites that are uh, websites that pertain to natural products, either reviewing them, selling them, etc. And we looked at people who interact with those websites, that go to those websites and, inter and, and engage with them. 
And based on those people, we created, we looked at their patterns and found the patterns, modeled those patterns and found uh, um, and scaled that audience into more people that would be interested in uh, uh, engaging with the Naturals websites. And based on that, we did, then did our analysis. So it's based on people's behavior in terms of going to look at those websites. Um, another question that I see is you mentioned behavior data. What kind? So the behavioral data that we look at uh, specifically are things like visiting certain websites, engaging with certain uh, uh, content, going to certain locations physically, whether it's banks or AMC theaters or, you know, uh, 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 Pinkberry or any, any location that, that you go to, we uh, get the geolocations for those. So that's what we mean by behavioral data. Um, is the daily updating of models 100% automatic or is there a human component? Good question, Christine. The infrastructure that we have built over the 10 years of our existence is one where these 10,000 models get built and maintained at scale automatically. So we've got servers that build and refresh these models over and over again on a daily basis, so without human intervention. Um, any more details from fuel cycle on the integration? I understand the augmented profile, but what does it lead to aside from knowing more? How are the insights better? Rick, can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. I think uh, I think you know really what it comes down to it that the value of research and insights is being being able to be accurate, right, and to accurately forecast an outcome, uh, whether qualitative or quantitative. You want to be able to to tell uh, your business partners and stakeholders what's going to happen or what would happen in a different scenario, right? And so by pulling in behavioral data. And going beyond, you know, going beyond just what people uh, are, like basic uh, segmentation, uh, we're able to be much more prescriptive in terms of, you know, what how insights apply to our business, and you're able to actually tie insights back to revenue. For instance, if we know that, uh, uh, let me use an example. If we know that, uh, uh, you know, a certain segment of, of consumers. Uh, has a low propensity to spend, you know, on uh, on brand names, uh, and they prefer like value brands. Um, you know, when you're developing a, a high-end CPG product, uh, you can know that, you know, you can weight uh, the re research results against that. So you would know not to include uh, those types of, you know, that segment information into your analysis and kind of forecast of what's going to happen. And instead, focus on people who have higher affinity for uh, luxury brand names and things like that. So it goes beyond just demographics and uh, you know, other kind of more um, human-derived segmentation schemes and has you focus on where is revenue actually at and how do we properly activate those channels. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, so I see James is asking, I'm surprised the segmentation didn't include a group with health problems like autoimmune diseases. Is that something you would have been able to pick up? So the answer is yes, we would have been able to pick that up. We did, this was a, a, uh, an example and I didn't show everything that we picked up. I wanted to highlight a few different things. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that if we had delved deeper into the preventative health advocates, we would have seen more about specific conditions that they were looking at and autoimmunes would probably have been part of that. Um, in the analyses that we do on a regular basis for our customers, we do dive in very deep and get to those granularities. In this case, I just wanted to highlight uh, the breadth and the depth of what we're able to see. Um, Melinda is asking, do you focus mostly on unstructured data or is an equal amount of focus placed on structured data? So we focus on structured data. Uh, we look at websites that people are visited, locations that people visit. 
We also do a certain amount of unstructured data looking. There are processes that we do that require natural language processing to understand context between different types of websites that people visit. So there, it, when we look at related and co-visitation of websites, we utilize also unstructured data in order to ascertain that similarity. Martin is asking, are you also doing forecasting and predictions based on historic website category usage? So the answer is yes. We do both the descriptive and the prescriptive analyses. The prescriptive anal analyses in terms of prediction of outcomes are used a lot for targeting, for understanding who to message, who's more likely to uh, do whatever outcome it is that we're measuring uh, for the client's use case. So uh, the answer is absolutely yes, we do prediction and forecasting. Um, thanks so much, Joy is asking. Thanks so much for the questions to ask of an AI provider. Very helpful, you're welcome. A question regarding the early predictive signals. They may not become probiotic consumers if you are targeting based on these early predictive signals don't you risk overestimating the target market? The answer is yes. Um, we look at it as a funnel. When you're thinking about the marketing funnel, then, then the upper funnel activity that you do is usually more of an awareness campaign where you're not necessarily getting them to be directly consumers of the product. And as you go down the funnel, it becomes more of a direct response campaign where it is to get them in there to buy. So the, uh, by, by definition and inherently, the fact that they're early signals doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to become probiotics customers, but the earlier that you can engage with them, hopefully the ones that will, you can shepherd them into that funnel. So yes, you do run the risk of overestimating the target market, but it comes as a, um, a, a combination of strategies to also do awareness uh, engagement at the upper funnel level, as well as more direct response engagements lower uh, down into the funnel closer to them being in the, in the interest market. Also, do you work with any other community providers, aka Vision Critical? Um, we work with a, a slew of different providers. so. We can maybe take that offline and we can discuss um, further. How is the website activity data collected? Is it web scraping? Good question, Dustin. Um, the, the web activity is collected due to the fact that we have exposure to programmatic advertising bid stream. Uh, since we started historically as a digital advertising tech company and a uh, provider of uh, um, uh, serving ads, we have exposure to that uh, bid stream fire hose in the programmatic advertising ecosystem. And so we see all of the different ad-enabled activities that happen. We also have data partnerships uh, through third-party data providers where we see non-ad-enabled web activity as well as other partners in SDK that we get uh, uh, geolocation data. So that's our exposure to those types of activities. We don't do web scraping in order to get that. Another question, building segments, how much of data comes from websites than primary survey? So when we build our segments, these are behavioral segments. The data comes 100% from our behavioral data, websites, locations, content, interests, etc. The uh, survey data can then be merged at different levels and for different purposes depends on the use case. Um, we can use it at an at a, uh, uh, atomic level of uh, using the survey data as features for clustering. Uh, there are many different use cases where we could do that, but the example that we provided the clustering is uh, done, the segmentation is done purely on behavioral data. Joy, you're very welcome. I was happy to answer.
Tracy is asking, can you talk a little bit more about how this could be used for better media planning? So Tracy, good question. I think that pertains back to the funnel that we looked at. And uh, maybe I answered it a little bit in terms of those different types of campaigns that you might run at different parts of the funnel and what audiences you might want to target for those different campaigns. So if, you, if we look at the upper funnel early signals, there were different audiences and interests that were maybe uh, uh, good to target as an awareness campaign. And knowing what those audiences are could also um, uh, help with actual creative planning and, and, uh, so that you can target them in a more direct manner that speaks and resonates to them versus going on down the funnel to those audiences that are lower in the funnel where you can do a more direct response campaign and again possibly even uh, creative, uh, uh, decide on certain creatives that will speak to those interests and resonate with them more. Um, model evaluation and what are some ways you use to val validate your models? So we have internal processes of va validating the models and comparing them to ground truth data and to sort of general population data. But more importantly, we, um, we, we, we eat our own dog food and we utilize these models for performance-based digital media campaigns that we run through our media arm. Utilizing the, the audiences that we see that perform better based on our, on our analytics also lo leads to uh, better performance in the media campaigns so we can validate that these models are actually working. Okay, I think I've gone through all the questions that I've seen. If anybody has any other questions, now's the time. We have one more. Let me. Okay, there you go. Regarding, okay, Tracy is asking, regarding the example of the survey behavioral integration, how do you go about getting someone who was in the behavioral portion to take a survey when there is PII that we have to be careful of? Good question, Tracy. So we are going to work together and the way that we integrate, there are ways that we can bridge that gap through either going through third party anonymizing uh, uh, parties, companies, so that we don't get the PII, or that on, on the survey partner's side, there's some sort of identifier that is sent to us that still is not PII. So we will never have any exposure to the PII and yet we can still integrate and send the data back and forth where the survey partner, on the survey partner side, it will get matched to the PII. Um, there was another question about uh, if we have access to search data. We do have access to search data and that is another way that we can create uh, audiences and interested based on, on search, based on keywords um, in the websites. There, there are many different types of audiences that we can create behaviorally based on these interests. And then I also see a question, um, so what are the other market research applications of AI other than segmentation and audience targeting? So, as we mentioned, um, you know, you could look at predictive geolocation insights. Um, you could predict behavior in terms of um, one of the things that we look at is trying to um, look at groups that are not engaging to understand how we can make them more engaging. Um, and so transitioning them basically from a state of um, you know, not being so interested or engaged to a state of being recurring high value engagers. So there are a lot of different, it really depends on the use cases. If there are use cases and there are research problems that you have, many times we can find an AI application for it. Um, for example, one of, the, one of the projects that we did was using our behavioral data to predict which brick and mortar locations will thrive and fail. Um, so we looked specifically at a certain retailer and stores that had closed in the last year 
to see if we can predict for that retailer which stores were in danger of closing in the next year. Another such ex example with geolocation data was for a big toy retail chain that had gone out of business and closed. We had a client that was interested in buying those locations but wanted to know what to put in there instead, what would be more successful. So by analyzing the behavioral patterns of people in the zip codes around those empty locations, we were able to come up with recommendations. Some of them were sporting goods stores. Some of them should have been uh, men's clothing locations. So depending on the, on, the, on the area, the region, based on the uh, most over-indexing behaviors of that area, we could see recommendations of what to do with those locations. So it, it, the sky's the limit for what we can do with, um, uh, to answer market research questions with uh, the AI engine. Uh, Jewel is asking, how much data do you need? What if you're a smaller business? That's a good question. The rule of thumb is always the more data, the better. Um, and for modeling purposes, we would need, by, again, by rule of thumb, sort of really high estimate of around 1,000 people or 1,000 uh, uh, records in order to uh, create a statistically significant model. But that depends. That can change. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but we've been successful with uh, small and medium businesses as well, depending on, again, the research question. And the great thing with all of this data that we have, because we're seeing 250 million people a day in the entire United States, is that even if you don't have enough first party data, or for some reason you can't get it to us legally or something, we have enough data that we can use as a proxy for that purpose so that we can use it. And so while it's not the strongest and most direct signal of your customers' behaviors, it's still, a, it's still a, a enough of a signal to find something. So for example, if you're a very small uh, beauty shop and you don't have enough uh, web traffic in order for us to build a model off of, we have beauty shopper audiences that can be used as proxies in order to get an understanding of what consumers are doing and behaving. Um, and, and we've seen in the past that that's been enough of a, of a signal to, to be helpful. So it looks like we're coming up on our time. So I just wanted to say thank you again. And thank you to Rick Kelly from Fuel Cycle for sharing that case study with us. And hopefully this was helpful. If you have any other questions or want to follow up, feel free to reach out to me at analytics at distillery.com. And we'll be more than happy to continue any conversations um, that are necessary. Great. Thank you so much, Gilad and Rick. We appreciate you being here today. And thank you, everyone, who attended the webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.